The following message by Alistair Begg is made available by Truth For Life. For more information, visit us online at truthforlife.org. We're going to read from the Bible in the Old Testament in the book of Ecclesiastes. And I encourage you, if you have a Bible, to turn to it. And when we have read this chapter, we'll pray and then we'll study it together. So you may want to keep your Bible open. And if you do not have a Bible but would like to use one of the church Bibles and you're unfamiliar with your way around, then you can turn to page 477. And I think you'll discover there that uh, it contains Ecclesiastes chapter 10. So page 477 in the church Bibles, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, and we're going to read from verse 1. As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. The heart of the wise inclines to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. Even as he walks along the road, the fool lacks sense and shows everyone how stupid he is. If a ruler's anger rises against you, do not leave your post. Calmness can lay great errors to rest." There is an evil I have seen under the sun, the sort of error that rises from a ruler. Fools are put in many high positions, while the rich occupy the low ones. I've seen slaves on horseback, while princes go on foot like slaves. Whoever digs a pit may fall into it. Whoever breaks through a wall may be bitten by a snake. Whoever quarries stones may be injured by them. Whoever splits logs may be endangered by them. If the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. If a snake bites before it's charmed, there's no profit for the charmer. Words from a wise man's mouth are gracious, but a fool is consumed by his own lips. At the beginning, his words are folly. At the end, they're wicked madness, and the fool multiplies words. No one knows what is coming. Who can tell him what will happen after him? A fool's work wearies him. He does not know the way to town. Woe to you, O land, whose king was a servant and whose princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, whose king is of noble birth and whose princes eat at a proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. If a man is lazy, the rafters sag. If his hands are idle, the house leaks. A feast is made for laughter and wine makes life merry, but money's the answer for everything. Do not revile the king even in your thoughts, or curse the rich in your bedroom, because a bird of the air may carry your words, and a bird on the wing may report what you say." Father, as we study the Bible together, it is our earnest longing that you will come and help us uh, do for us what we are unable to do for ourselves, speak and listen and hear and understand and apply and obey and believe. We're entirely dependent upon you, and we seek your gracious help in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the writer is about to turn uh, around the final bend and into the back straight, and we're going to reach chapter 11 and chapter 12 soon enough. But before he uh, fills in a couple of the blanks that he has been deliberately leaving, he provides here in chapter 10 under the heading, if you like, two-word heading, be sensible, a whole succession of proverbial statements. And he employs them in order to encourage his readers to resist folly and to embrace wisdom. And even a cursory reading of the text and a little glance at it again will make clear to you that approximately 33% of it uh, actually addresses the issue of folly in a very straightforward fashion. We've spoken before about visiting Scotland, the west of Scotland, and the town of Oban, and finding as we arrived there the Colosseum-like structure which looks down over the bay. And perhaps for the first time going up to look at it, Uh, thinking that it must be quite magnificent, only to be thoroughly disappointed, to discover that it's just a shell, it's empty, and it serves no useful function at all. And when we inquired, we discovered that it was built by a man called Mr. McCaig, and it has been known for the last hundred years or more as McCaig's Folly. 
It stands there as a description, as a depiction of folly. Uh, built to impress, possessing no practical value at all. And when you turn to chapter 10, you almost sense that he is constructing for us uh, the anatomy of folly, that he is providing here the portrait, the identical picture, the sketch, the outline of folly itself. It's almost embodied in the way in which he addresses it. And in order to try and come to terms with it, I want to uh, trace a line through the passage, uh, beginning first by considering the first four verses under the heading, Folly on the Street. Folly on the Street. Or if you like, Folly down at street level or at ground level. He begins with a very straightforward illustration from common life. His immediate readers would have understood it perfectly. Those of us who scoosh out of these tiny little bottles, whether it is men's cologne or women's perfume, uh, would be hard-pressed to discover how a dead fly could possibly get into one of those little bottles. Uh, obviously, the picture is different. The creation of perfume uh, uh, in, in a salve or in an ointment form when it was being put together or even when it was available for use could be spoiled very, very quickly by the entry of a fly that presumably was alive when it reached it, but dead after it had spent a little time in the bowl. And so he says that it's a tiny little thing, but it has a terrific impact uh, despite how small it is. And then he says, in the same way, it really doesn't take much folly to mar a reputation to ruin the happy mixture of life. And we understand that, either by experience or uh, certainly by observation. A man or a woman's life, a family, a nation, a home, a business kind of gone along swelly for a significant length of time, and then as a result of some silly lapse of judgment, some foolish slip, all of its reputation comes crashing down. Who would ever have thought that the proud and prosperous company, Arthur Anderson, would ever end as it has done? It takes a tremendous amount of effort to build a very, very successful enterprise. It takes only a small amount of folly to destroy it. Now, you can apply that at every level. We're not going to delay here. Young people should apply it. They should think about it. Teenagers and children should think about it in terms of looking forward to the day when they will be married, and they should think about how easy it would be for them to lose their virginity in a moment of absolute stupidity. You don't have to remain this way for the rest of your life. You only need to remain this way for the next five minutes. Five minutes at a time. And especially the five minutes when all hell lets loose against you. And when some character with a leering grin suggests to you that this is the way that everyone's going. You may build your reputation all the way through high school and destroy it in five minutes. Don't do it. As a dead fly spoils the fragrance of perfume, so a little folly destroys wisdom and honor. In common parlance, it's easier to cause a stink than create a sweetness. Foolish impulses need to be guarded against. Unguarded moments, hasty words, the irritable temper, the rudeness of manner, the occasional slip, the supposedly harmless eccentricity of old George, you know. I have all these fictitious characters, as you know. I have Mabel from Minnesota, and I have George. I employ him routinely. I, I have no George, actually, in mind. He is a completely fictitious character. But watch out for old George. As, as he likes to kiss the women. And people say he's eccentric. You know, he just does that to everyone. Don't be so sure. We've had a number of old Georges roaming around Parkside. We've had to run some of them out of town as they sought uh, rights to their home from younger women in the church, women who thought they would get there in safety. So be on your guard. Appoint moral sentries. Don't be foolish. Don't be stupid. Be skeptical. Don't be cynical. Be skeptical, first of all, with yourself. It takes a lot of hard work to build a reputation. It takes very little to make a hash of it. That's the point he's making. You don't have to be a genius to understand it. And his foolishness isn't easily disguised. Disguised—that's the obvious indication in this comic picture in verse three, isn't it? 
You can sense that the fool is approaching because everyone else backs off. If you're standing in a crowd and a fool approaches you, you will notice that there's only two of you left. Because if the people know that he's a fool, they're moving away. Here comes crazy George, they say to themselves. We don't want to be around for this. The fool expects that everyone will listen to every word that he says, but he doesn't pay much attention to other people when they're speaking to him. You can tell he's glancing here, he's glancing there. He says, aha, every so often, aha, aha, but he doesn't know what he's aha to. When he walks down the street, he just looks daft. He can't disguise his stupidity. And don't ever ask him to deliver an important message for you. You'd be better chopping off your feet than giving an important message to a fool to deliver. So says Solomon, Proverbs 26. Now, we didn't work this out to, to any great degree, but it is quite tragic. It is very comedic. The person, the, the people in Scotland, after they've been drinking far too much on their way to football matches, soccer matches, uh, sometimes they walk on the roofs of cars and on the bonnets of cars, the hoods of cars, and they, because, because the, the, the crush in the street is so much. So they say, hey, we'll just walk on the cars. And you can see them coming down until the policeman or someone chases them off. They look really stupid. And what about the people in Cleveland with all those dumb masks on their heads, barking like dogs and eating biscuits? <laughs> Do you think it's possible to be treated seriously as a city in the face of the world in the United States with this kind of nonsense going on? The fool as he walks along the road, lacks any sense, everybody knows how stupid he is. And his folly actually comes out when one day, in sitting in his office, his, his boss has, had a, has, has got up on the wrong side of the bed and has decided to give him what for. And so the fool decides that he will show the boss that he doesn't have to put up with this. And the boss's anger having risen against him, he says... I'm out of here. And he starts taking the pictures off his wall in his office, even as the boss hasn't finished speaking. And he starts putting his pens and everything in the box. Or if he's in the boardroom, he stands up and he says, enough of this. I will not put up with this. And out he goes, only to get down the bottom of the stairs and realize that he left his favorite fountain pen sitting on the desk. And now he has the horrible task of having to go back up the stairs in the room in which he's just made such a fool of himself and say, excuse me, I, just, I left my pen. The people just look at him. He takes his pen, he puts it in his pockets, and as he walks away, and as the door closes, you just hear the people going, fool, 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 fool. Says Kidner, it may feel magnificent to resign your post ostensibly on principle, but actually in a fit of pride. It is in fact less impressive and more immature than it feels. Don't do it. Don't do it. There's a lot of ways to leave, but don't leave that way. Believe me, it is a dumb idea. Only a fool walks out in those circumstances. The fact that his boss is already off kilter doesn't mean that he should or she should respond in the same way as the unruly activity of his boss's anger. Better to let him stew in his own juice for a wee while and instead make sure that by calmness you can lay great errors to rest. You don't have to excuse your boss's anger. You can at least rationalize it. Well, maybe someone was shouting at him. Maybe he had a flat tire. Maybe his kids are driving him nuts. Whatever it is, well, I just, I'm just going to go and get myself a coffee. He'll, he'll, he'll settle down later on in the day. I know he always does. Calmness can lay great errors to rest. Patience may persuade a ruler, and a gentle tongue can break a bone. The trouble is that patience and folly seldom walk down the road holding hands. That's folly on the street. We need to move on. Verses 5 to 7, 16 and 17. Folly in high places. Folly in high places. Look at verse 5. There's an evil I've seen under the sun, the sort of error that arises from a ruler. Now, this is not uh, down on the street now. This is up in the higher echelons of social strata. And what he says in this section is folly knows no class distinction. There are fools everywhere, he says. You find them down on the street, you can find them in government, you find them in business, you find them all over the place. And apparently from this, uh, fools in government has been a consistent feature throughout all of history. 
George III was notable for a number of reasons, but not least of all for the fact that he was to be seen regularly walking in his gardens in Windsor Park and talking to the trees. So the people would say, there, there goes George III. It's not even coffee time, and he's having an amazing conversation with a large oak tree out in his phenomenal back garden. Perhaps he had been reading Roman history and recognized that Caligula, the Roman emperor, had decided that his uh, horse should stand for governmental office. And he urged upon the population that his horse be elected as a consul in the Roman strata. And so he kitted his horse out with a beautiful marble stall and purple blankets and encouraged the population to come and pay due deference to his horse. Hmm. That's kind of stupid, isn't it? Foolishness. Now, when you have the kind of leadership that is described in verse 5, then you ought not to be surprised by the upheavals that are represented in verses 6 and 7. Verse 7 is an apt summary of revolution that takes place in a way that is wrong and harmful. You can think of any kind of revolution you want. I read verse 7. It made me think of Tsarist Russia, Nicholas and Alexandria, and then all that came as a result of the overthrow and the emergence of communism. Some of you may read this and say, well, it makes me think of uh, uh, the revolutions of uh, Central Europe. Somebody may look at this and say, it makes me think of the American uh, wars of independence. There's all kinds of ways that we could view this. Therefore, we need to be careful and understand that the main things are the plain things. What is being said here? What he is saying is this. Then what, when what is natural and sensible and orderly is in place, then wisdom may prosper. But when what is unnatural, unsensible, and disorderly is in place, then folly will become the order of the day. When individuals are incapable of making wise choices in their own lives, in their private lives, then they shouldn't be put in public office. It's straightforward. Every sensible person understands that. If you can't trust somebody to go and get you a coffee and bring you the right change, why would you trust them to oversee a budget that extends to seven or eight hundred million and covers 25 states? If you cannot trust an individual to live in moral purity and fidelity with his wife, why would you trust him to do anything else? It's just sensible. And the Bible speaks with great sense concerning it. In verses 16 and 17, you have this wonderful contrast, which makes the point, doesn't it? Woe to you, O land, whose king was a servant. Now, I know you don't like kings, so let's just change that to president. Woe to you, O land, whose president, and, and change servant to peon, if you like, uh, who was a, who, who was a, an, a useless character. The, the point here, this is not some kind of uh, domineering uh, right-wing establishment cause. He, he, he's simply saying when things are out of kilter, woe to you when your president is somebody who shouldn't be and whose consorts feast in the morning. Woe to you when in the White House you have a clown as a president and you have consorts who simply party like crazy. When your citadel of government is marked by confusion, is marked by infidelity, is marked by disrespect, and is marked by just nonsense. But blessing attends, verse 17, when your president is someone who should be there, when his cohorts eat at a proper time, and when they eat in order to be strong so that they might exercise government rather than that they become carousers like the group that is mentioned in verse 16. Now, I suppose you would want me to apply that, but I'm not going to apply it at all. I think you, I think you probably think that I may even have somebody in mind when I'm mentioning verses 16 and 17. I don't know why you would ever think such a thing. <laughs> folly on the street, folly in high places. Thirdly, folly at work. Folly at work. You dig a pit, you fall in, you break through the wall, a snake bites you, you quarry stones, you bang your head with them, you split logs, and they're flying all over the place. Look at this crazy person here. Be realistic, he says. The pit that traps its maker is a picture of poetic justice. The unnoticed serpent 
is the very image of lurking retribution. There is so much about life that is unpredictable, and therefore, if we go at it in a foolish and haphazard way, then there's no saying just what may happen to us. In verse 10, we have a blinding glimpse of the obvious, don't we? If the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. <laughs> the man's wife says, don't go hammering out there with that axe. It hasn't been sharpened in a year and a half. No, no, he says, it's fine. It's fine. If I, I just hit it a little harder, I, I think I can be successful. So the blunt edge of the axe is borne down again and again upon the wood. And his wife stands and looks out of the window at him as he comes, be, grows increasingly red and, and dreadful perspiration. And she says to herself, what a fool. Five minutes of sharpening would have made this so much easier. He look at what he has to do in the absence of the little amount of skill that would bring success. So picture him in verse 11, a comedic picture again, as he says that he's going to go off and venture into the entertainment industry. He's going to develop a little business of his own. He's going to become a snake charmer. And what he needs is a basket and a snake and a flute. And he has the basket, he has the snake, he has the flute. But before he can get the flute up to his lips and get playing and get himself organized, the snake is so tired of waiting for the music that the snake comes out of the basket on its own and bites one of the people on the front row before the snake charmer can even start charming. And if you've seen these kind of things at work, you know that what has to happen is he does the performance and then he asks for money. But if the snake starts to bite the people who are watching before he has a chance to charm the snake, what chance does he have? If you don't charm, you don't charge. That's how it goes. What a fool. Look at this guy. He can't get out of his own way. And when he engages in any kind of work at all, verse 15, it's always tiring. How are you? I'm tired. Well, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm weary. What would you like to go? So, no, I don't think so. Um, some of us are going, no, I don't think so, no. This guy, verse 15, can get lost in an elevator. That's what he says. Everybody knows the way to town. He's the only guy that doesn't know the way to town. Where are you going? I'm going to town. Oh, is that where the town is? Yes. Why don't you know that? Everybody knows that. I'm a fool. I don't know the way. Do you want to find out? No, I don't think so, no. No, I think I'll just stay here. I'll be here. I'll be here when you get back. I'm always here. Fourthly, folly in his words. Folly in his words. Verse 12. Words from a wise man's mouth are gracious, but a fool is consumed by his own lips. That's quite a picture, isn't it? Eating yourself. This is kind of like suicide by a cannibal, the best way he knows how. A fool is consumed by his own lips. It's going to take some quality graphic art to, de to depict this, isn't it? This takes us way back into Monty Python's Flying Circus and some of those strange little creatures that used to emerge out of pipes and everything, and they, they gobble themselves up and eat themselves and so on. It's this crazy picture here. The wise man's mouth is full of gracious words. They are, they, they are encouraging. They are developmental. They lift people up. But a fool, he swallows himself. He eats himself. His words begin with folly, and in the end, they are wicked madness. What does that mean? It means that at the very outset of things, he refuses to begin with God. He refuses to begin with the fear of God. He says, no, 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 no. I do not go for that. And as he begins from there, then his words end in wicked madness. I discovered now that you don't have to have any special cable channels on your television to be confronted routinely by wicked madness. I mean, you don't have to sign up for anything special. You just take whatever is on offer. And you will find in the routine male-dominated culture of clicking the buttons that uh, you will click routinely, and if you just do it on a random basis, it will be virtually impossible for you to do one of your complete cycles without being confronted at some point by just wickedness and madness in a phrase or in a description, whatever else it is. And you say to yourself, where did this wicked madness come from? How did this thing get so wicked and so mad so quickly? 
Well, the answer is it began with folly. He begins with folly, and he ends with wicked madness. The folly that says there is no God, therefore there is no one to whom I am accountable. As Dostoevsky says, if God is dead, then all things are permissible. So we have concluded that God is dead, or he is at least on vacation. And certainly that if he does exist and does come back from, from vacation, he is such a kindly individual that he's not concerned at all about what we believe or how we behave and so on. Therefore, we can consume ourselves with wicked madness. Is it possible? Was it just in routine television? It has to be. Was it on the O'Reilly factor? I think it was. You can tell I'm thinking as I speak. That we had the blanked out visions from Indiana University of some other television network going in and, and seeking to do manifoldly wicked and indescribable things with some of the dumbest university students you could ever meet on the face of the planet. Foolish, foolish kids in one of the good universities, beginning with folly and ending with manifold wickedness. Is this what their parents paid for? to finally see them on the big screen in such resplendent ignominy? You say to me, the Bible, you know, it's a way out there somewhere. Give me a book that speaks to the issues of the day. Tell me something, you know, that relates. I tell you, this is as up-to-date as the current news events. Look at it. And even though he knows that he's talking nonsense, still, verse 14, he multiplies his words— He doesn't know what's coming, but he likes to pontificate as if he does. And he is unable to control these words, as verse 20 points out. He'd do well to shut up. He would do well not to think that in the privacy of his bedroom he would be able to curse the rich because a little bird may carry his words. Isn't it strange how that happens? I mean, we say that to our children. I think I said that to my children. Be careful, the little bird, you know, doesn't take hear what you're saying and take it away. I didn't know where that came from until I read again uh, Ecclesiastes 10. It's actually a biblical allusion. It's a biblical metaphor. A little bird may come. Of course, no little literal bird comes, but the picture is clear. You can say many kind things, and they, apparently no one hears them. You can say one unkind thing, and it gets telegraphed all across humanity. For example, in the second service, at an earlier point, I said something that I know many people have already told you. I said a dreadful thing, a dreadful thing to say. I mean, I can't even believe how bad it was that I said it. Do you want to know what it was? Uh, I, I don't need to tell you because a little bird will tell you. I said at one point, not in my sermon, but I said at one point, I can think of few worse ways to spend a Sunday than reading The Plain Dealer and watching The Cleveland Browns. And there was almost a revolution. People were getting up out of their seats. It was as if I propounded heresy. That's my personal opinion. You may enjoy that. For me, that's not a good Sunday. But you could see the anger. You see it rising. I can feel the letters coming my way already and the emails too. I confess it to you. It was an unguarded statement. Foolish. I wish I could have it back. But I can't. Obviously, I don't wish it that much, or I wouldn't have told it to you again. (laughs) But I do take seriously what Jesus said, that by our words we would be condemned, and by our words we would be acquitted. What did Jesus mean in Matthew 12? He said, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, and a foolish life has foolish words, and a wise life has wise words. Folly on the street, folly in high places, folly at work, folly in words, and finally folly in the end. Folly in the end. In the end, the the fool misses the feast, verse 19. The feast is made for laughter, and wine makes life merry, but money is the answer for everything. Now, remember the framework with which he is viewing things. Don't dismiss this too quickly. What he's saying is that God's wholesome gifts are good— When they're used properly, they're delightful, they're perfectly sufficient. And furthermore, money is the most versatile of all the gifts, and therefore should be used properly. You remember the words of Jesus? We consider them in Luke. Was it 16? Yes, it was. I tell you, use worldly wealth, said Jesus. Use money to gain friends for yourself, so that when it's gone, 
you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Remember how enigmatic that statement was? You remember how some of us struggled with it and wrestled with it? And we discovered that Jesus was saying something here that some of us just didn't like? Because either we find ourselves uh, hidden away in money, or we find ourselves resenting all who have any money. But the fact of the matter is, money is the most versatile of the gifts. That's why our children will sometimes say to us, when we say to them, what would you like for your birthday, especially if they get older, what do they say? Give me money. Why? Well, at least if you give me money, I can control what's happening. You give me another dumb tie, then I'm stuck with that, especially if you cut the tags off it. I can't, I can't redeem it for anything that I really want to use. Or think about your wedding. I mean, we don't want to be unkind to the people who gave us presents, but we got these presents from people that we didn't even know, who didn't even like us and didn't even care. And they all gave us the same thing. Those dreadful bowls that you're supposed to put candy or mints in or something. They all they have three little, three little f feet on them, and they, and, and they sit on tables. And you, you remember, you're sitting there in, in, in the evening. Oh, hey, here's another one. And you, and you looked at it, and, you, and by now, you, the size of the box scares you. You don't even have to open it. <laughs> You look at your fiance and you say, I think it's another one. She said, I think it is. And you open it up and sure enough it is. Oh no, not another one. Not another. Now, now we have a little collection. We're able to put them all the way around the circular coffee table that the person gave us. We have no coffee cups. We have a coffee table, but we have plenty of room for candy. <laughs> and we look at one another and we say, I wish they'd given us the money. I wish they gave us the money. It's not that we don't appreciate the gifts, but what are you going to do with them? At least if we had money, we could buy candy to actually put in one of them. <laughs> but we don't have any money to fill them up, therefore they look even dafter than they are, the whole retinue of them laid out in that way. The fool doesn't come around for any of this. The essence of his predicament is described there. In verse 18, look at him, sitting beneath his sagging rafters, dodging the leaks, moving the plastic pails to make sure that the puddles don't form on his threadbare carpets. Everybody else seems to know the way to town. He doesn't know. Apparently, he doesn't care. He shows up on the fringes of the feast, but he never really laughs. He's never able to enjoy the meals the way that some others seem to do. He's been so foolish about the way that he goes about business that he doesn't enjoy the versatility of the gift of money itself. What's the problem here? The problem is that he, he skipped Wisdom 101. He bypassed the words of Solomon, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He's foolish. He's foolish by nature, but now he's foolish by choice. You see, this morning, each of us is not in a, in a neutral category whereby we can either choose foolishness or choose wisdom. The Bible says that we are foolish. We're like sheep that go astray. By our very natures, we put our fingers in our ears to the Word of God. We seek to run away and, and discover the riddle of life by ourselves. Can I tell you that being a fool in this life is to face the next life totally unprepared? To be a fool in this life and to forsake the remedy is to face the next life totally unprepared. Sin is folly because it is disobedience to and it is rebellion against the will of God who made you, who loves you, who sustains you, and who will finally assess you. This is a real topsy-turvy notion because the world, in its wisdom, thinks that the message of the good news is foolish, and yet it is the very apparent foolishness of the good news which God has chosen as the expression of His wisdom. Let me read it to you, and then I'm done. This is how Paul described it to the Corinthians. He said, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. 
Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its own wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. God was pleased through the foolishness of a kind of marginal sermon from Ecclesiastes 10 to save those of you who will believe. God has been pleased. It seems really foolish, doesn't it? That he would use individuals like us to convey his message. That he would take as the apex of the good news the death of his son upon a cross and all of the ignominy and dying uh, that is represented there. And he would say, here then is my wisdom. Embrace it and be done with your foolishness. Reject it and live as a fool. Do you believe today? I don't mean do you believe in terms of just an intellectual awareness of truth, but have you ever come to rest solely and wholly on the wisdom of Christ? And if not, you could simply cry out from your heart as our service ends, Lord Jesus Christ, I am so foolish. Give me your wisdom to see and follow your truth. Lord Jesus Christ, I am so foolish. Give me your wisdom to see and follow your truth. We'd love to help you down the road that is Mark wisdom and away from the foolishness of our pride, proud hearts. Father, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who chooses to take up the words of mere men and to use them to accomplish his purposes. We pray now that you will snatch us from the folly of our lives, our pride, that acts as if we know everything and have been everywhere. That will bring us to see the end of that. That we may be honest enough to admit that we don't know, but that we do need to know. Fulfill your purposes in each life this morning, we pray, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with each one who believes today and forevermore. Amen. This message was brought to you from Truth For Life, where the learning is for living. To learn more about Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, visit us online at truthforlife.org.